Welcome to Ask Psych Sessions with Marianne Lloyd, where we ask some of the best teachers we know questions from you, our audience. If you have a question or an idea for a conversation, please visit bit.ly backslash Ask Psych Sessions. That's B-I-T dot L-Y backslash Ask Psych Sessions. All one word, all lowercase. And here's our next question. Thanks for joining us today. There are two guests with me on Zencaster testing out our new video capacity at the same time. So hopefully mm-hmm. enjoy those nonverbal cues. I'm with Dr. Jennifer Gruy and Dr. Chris Eleven, both from Utah State University. Before we jump into the purpose of this episode, which is to talk about having an all remote lab on purpose, not just because of the pandemic, perhaps you could each, uh, each introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm Jennifer Gruy. I am an assistant professor in the psychology department. I co-direct our undergraduate program with uh, Dr. Chris Levin, who's here too today. I also have, I, I teach online and face-to-face classes. I teach face-to-face classes when we don't have a pandemic, but I have taught uh, for a number of years. Um, my kind of main specialty area is introductory psychology, and I really love doing that. I also direct our first year experience program at the university that has about, we, we have around 3,000 students that go through that program every year. So that's, yeah, that's a little bit about me. And I am Chris Eleven, and I teach actually exclusively online, whether or not there's a pandemic. I've always done that. I've been a faculty member at USU um, since 2017. Um, Before 2017, I did both teaching in person and online. However, I do have a physical disability. And so um, even though I do love kind of the in-person teaching experience, as all of us do, I love getting the feedback and feel from um, people in the room. There's actually like a really good uh, utility for me to teaching online. And also I have a history of uh, web-based design of uh, kind of one of my expertise in, is in my past research was looking at web-based treatments. And so I have this like really interesting history with web development, web-based utility that comes together in really looking at online teaching, online development, and online delivery uh, that I only work online, um, whether or not there's a pandemic. And so that came together for me to kind of co-direct the um, the undergraduate program with Jen Gruy, but also to focus specifically on our really large online uh, program at Utah State University, where we do have a, a really wide we- reach in our statewide worldwide program because we are... Uh, we, we have campuses all over the state. We're the land-grant land institution. And so we really try to reach students all over the state. But we've had students in our lab as far out as uh, a student studying abroad in Russia. We've had uh, students um, all over the country. And we want to make sure that they have this ability to kind of engage as well as our students who live close to the Logan campus. Great. Thank you. Um, so maybe let's jump right there. Uh, this idea that we can build some equity into our labs by providing remote lab opportunities, um, which I'll be honest until I saw that on your website or was trying to do a remote lab now, it's not something that would have occurred to me. So would you mind talking a little bit about why it's important that all of our students can potentially have these uh, experiences that are different with faculty than what happens in the classroom? Yeah, um, we, you know, Chris mentioned we have a really large online distance program at Utah State with our undergraduate um, degree in psychology. And one thing we noticed some years ago, and this is actually why we decided to kind of come together and create this lab, was that um, a lot of our distance students were not really receiving kind of the same sort of opportunities. They may have been getting opportunities and kind of some mentorship here and there, but not maybe the same, not the same maybe possible quality of um, opportunities as a lot of our on-campus students. And uh, that was, and I think the lack of those kind of opportunities and lack of those mentorship experiences 
can have some ripple effect for for distance students or for any student really and can in some ways limit their opportunities and their options um it's also you know they're not maybe able to pro- to get as many connections with faculty and and those connections are really important in a lot of different ways you know things like writing letters of recommendation um you know being able to kind of guide towards graduate school programs or career opportunities and so i think we both had this strong interest in providing students with a more equitable experience in terms of their under, undergraduate education. And the students are getting that in the classrooms um, with the online classes and our uh, face-to-face classes, but it's those kind of extra experiences beyond the classroom that we thought, you know, there seemed to be a little bit of a hole with our particular program. And so that's why we really wanted to provide um, these opportunities to these students. Also, you know, here I was on campus. Um, Krissa works remotely. And, you know, we, I found somebody that I really wanted to collaborate with and that was a really good fit, you know, in terms of a colleague to, to run a, a lab together. And, um, and so it, it, it just ended up being a good, a good match. And, and, that's kind of our basis and reasoning why we wanted to go that direction. Yeah. And I think um, one of the things that I think really jumpstarted the need for this lab was that we do have this required course where students are asked to engage in a research activity, an apprenticeship capstone. And we did see, as Jen mentioned, that there were students were able to find things that they could do. They could do data entry. They could engage in different things. But our distance students just weren't given the same sort of opportunities to engage, really engage in research. And, you know, being someone where I, you know, I work uh, at a distance primarily because I'm physically disabled. And that was an issue for, for me where I was looking at it and seeing like, this is an equity issue. This is an issue where we have students who um, some people are not able um, to come to campus for different reasons. It might be their location, but it might be a variety of different reasons. And we've found that in people who are joining our lab. We've found that we haven't really had anybody with physical disabilities, but we have found so many students who cannot go to campus who li- who may live in the Logan area. But one of the things that's come out of this that, you know, wasn't what I was expecting was stay-at-home moms. Um, You know, we live in the state of Utah where it's um, very common for people to kind of get married when they're in college and and things like that. We have had in one semester, we had seven stay at home moms in our lab. They cannot like their their schedules are not flexible in the same way. They cannot just like go to campus and say, like, I'll come to lab. I'll just join in whenever I want. You know, like it's a it's a very different experience. And and we see that they have the exact same goals as the, as the students who are going to campus and saying like they want to go to grad school, they want to do the same things, and yet we're denying them these same experiences that they're kind of like promised when they sign up uh, and pay the same tuition and these other things. So I think it's just this really, uh, you know, one of the reasons we formed it was to say like here's the experiences that you've been promised as part of your tuition, as part of signing up for college and. And that was uh, something that was really important to us and, and finding each other uh, uh, that worked together so well. I mean, uh, that we really enjoy each other. We enjoy bouncing ideas off of each other and working with students and value the same things in mentoring students and making the lab not about the outcomes, but about the process of mentorship. And, uh, and that's really ultimately what led to the development of this lab and doing it from a distance. Thank you. That's something for me to think about, right? What is in the brochure? What is in the acceptance materials? Right. Versus what is the experience and how can we make sure we're living up to our promises? Could you talk a little bit about um, even how you structure the lab? Do you have synchronous lab meetings, asynchronous content? Are there projects that already exist that people slip into? People are doing more independent work. Um, I'm just sort of trying to make a mental picture of being a member of your lab. So maybe I'll start and then Krista can fill in where I forget to things I forget to mention. But we have, um, I think one of the beauty, (laughs) beautiful things in our lab is that 
students are able to decide what level of commitment they want to do in the lab. And so we do have students and, and we don't, you know, we're not here saying, oh, you need to do this. You need to spend this much amount of time. They can really decide for themselves. Do they just want to sort of dabble in the topics and join lab meetings and kind of listen in? Or do they want to, you know, eventually kind of lead their own project? And so um, we've got that really clearly outlined in some student contracts so that it's very clear what our roles are in the lab and what their roles are and the expectations are. We ask them not to commit to anything that they can't, you know, hold themselves up to in terms of um, the, what these expectations are. And so the students decide that for themselves. And it can be a, like I said, anything from a, a semester long um, reading literature and creating a literature review to, uh, well, it, we can even go even less than that if they want to come to lab meetings and just kind of listen and maybe participate as they as they can, they can do that. All the way up to, we do have students that are leading the charge and doing their own research projects, which is from start to finish, which is really amazing for undergraduate students, I think, to be able to do. To you know, They're not just doing the data collection, they're doing the whole process and seeing it from start to finish. Um, and, and, and so it has meant that we, we work on kind of a, we, we start a project um, each semester. We have ongoing projects that are um, kind of circulate. We try on a year and a half to a two year timeline for most of our projects. So, so they're not typically, we try and um, limit it to topics that can be studied both within, a, you know, formulating the research question, going through the IRB process, collecting data, and you know, analyzing and disseminating those results within a two-year time frame. So, you know, that does limit our research questions a little bit, but we found that that's, that's pretty reasonable amount of times that an undergraduate student can get through the project without, um, uh, graduating, which it, that's always the problem with undergraduate students. They they come and they go so quickly. And they always graduate you know, is super annoying. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And you miss them. You're like, oh no, there there's another good one graduating. You wish they <laughs> didn't, but they have to. So yeah. Um. So that's that's kind of the structure. We do have weekly, uh, um, online meetings. We alternate between having students kind of talk and update about their own projects and what they're working on uh, to the, we, uh, on alternate weeks, we pick a, usually a theme of research articles that we have the students read and discuss about. Cause that was something that was really important to us is how do we maintain kind of a culture within our lab without, you know, having this, being able to walk down the hallway and knock on someone's door and say, you know, and, and talk about a particular or talk by the water fountain about a particular, how can we maintain this good, strong connection and culture? And we've built in some structure for that. Mm -hmm. But one of it is having those articles and having a discussion every other week on those articles. Chris, yeah. what, what else would you say about our lab? Yeah. So I think one thing is um, the way that, so Jen mentioned that we start a new uh, study every semester. But there's actually a, a tight structure to how we start these article, how we start these studies, and how we continue them. So every semester we start a project from scratch, and we continue a project with a new group of students. So the project we start from scratch is a group of students. So that course I told you about the research apprenticeship, the the research apprenticeship students who are only committing to one semester of participation in the lab, they are all assigned to a sub portion of uh, the given topic that we tell them. Like, this is the thing, this is a broad area that we're studying this semester. You do this sub portion of that topic, you do this sub portion of that topic, you do this sub portion, and they each write a literature review on their own sub topic. And that is now their research apprenticeship um, goal. But it's not just writing a, a lit review because they're doing it for a purpose. And that's the topic that we talk about for the whole semester in those articles that Jen talked about. Then the next semester, the new group of students who are committing to a full year, and those are who we call the student investigators, they take those lit reviews and then they can hit the ground running to start their IRB. 
So they, they form their own hypotheses. They form their own, like, this is exactly what we want to do with that topic. So they don't get to choose a topic, but they do get to choose what they want to do with the topic. We're, this is where we want to go. This is the question we want to ask and how we want to ask it. The, at the beginning of the semester, they start to choose their methodology, methodology and how they want to do it. Obviously, we only really work on Qualtrics and RedCap, that kind of thing. And then um, by the end of the semester, they always have their uh, their IRB completed. They always have their study materials done, obviously, because that's part of you know IRB. Um, and then by the beginning of the next semester, they're running subjects. Um, and so the whole thing should take one year to uh, basically run the study because they've started with a solid lit review that the res- that the student research assistants have set up for them. And so if students choose to continue with that same project, then they can do things like, you know, write it up, which doesn't generally happen. But basically every student in our lab has had a conference presentation if they choose to a full year commitment as a, as a student investigator. So we've had, I think, is it 14 conference presentations to date in three years? <laughs> I uh, can't keep track. There's quite a few. I- I, I think uh, it's 14 original conference presentations, but uh, but it's 20, if I remember, it's 24 conference presentations in total, but some of them are duplicates because we can swap out who, like, who's the first author. Like, one of them was, we have a student, like, an internal um, uh, research kind of conference at our school, and so we let people kind of do the same presentation both at our school and then one regional or one national where it's like, we don't really count it twice on our CVs, but I think it's 24 conferences total in three years um, where these students are just getting their practice is not as much for dissemination of science as it is for practicing, like doing, doing research. Um, And so that's kind of how that works is uh, a new study every semester, but then also a new engagement uh, at a different part of the process. And it just keeps going like that. Well, that sounds like a great system that fits a variety of students and they don't have to be there. So well done. Um, I'm going to thank you. Borrow some of these pieces as I think about my lab going forward. Um, Are you game for a little bit of a pivot to pick on a theme that I've been working on some other episodes? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so language. Turns out we've been talking about language a lot lately on the Ask Psych Sessions podcast. And you shared at the beginning that you are, and I am now going to catch myself saying this twice, right? A, a person with a physical disability, which I believe is called person first language, or I could identify you as a physically disabled person, which is identity right. first language. And so my method students just read an article about this, uh, that Morton and Gernsberger looked at like 1.5 million articles, so many articles, and how we use this language and why. APA recommends, I believe, person first, but this may not be great. And this was new information to me. So I'm going to guess for some of our listeners, it's new to them. You don't speak for all people with your identity. Of course. Thank you. Yes. (laughs) Given that, though, do you have some thoughts about this? Because I'm, you know, still guilty of someone that trips on their words because I'm trying to be conscientious of the humans that I'm teaching. And so I want to do, I want to make fewer mistakes, I guess, is my goal. Sure. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I just appreciate the conversation is, is really where I'm at with the, the language issue related to disability. I think for me personally, I think what's important is having the conversation and noticing, um, that it exists, right? That that there's people with disabilities uh, around. Um, I tend to use um, person first language when I'm paying attention. That's what I'm most comfortable with. But I I personally have no, uh, you know, like particular um, response to uh, disability first language. It's it's not something that I p- find particularly offensive. Um, and and yet, when there's people trying to be more inclusive in any way, I just find that really important. Um, I think the attempt is what matters, and the noticing that people 
exist and and that the world is a little bit more difficult. It's not built for people with disabilities, whether they're physical, whether they are, you know, different parts of the body. There's so many different ways that people can be disabled that you can see, that you cannot see, and that the world is not built for people. And one of the primary ways that language has historically tried to account for disability language is to actually remove the differences. And that part I find a little problematic, right? Like, handy capable. It's like, no, that's the whole problem. That is the whole darn problem. I am not super capable in my ability to like jog. Okay. So, um, if I were, we wouldn't have a problem. And so it's, uh, whatever the conversation is, having the conversation is, is what I think is great. Thank you. Right. It's like the colorblind equivalent. Exactly. We thought it was so good to pretend we don't see race. Well, that was a problem. So same here, right? <laughs> Pretending, right. Uh, you know, if I met you in real life that I didn't notice this is a worse option. So thank you. That's exactly. clear. So right. one thing that I thought I would mention that I really like about um, Krissa is, um, and hopefully I'm not out of line in saying this, but I, she, um, she doesn't pretend like it doesn't exist. And, and she does a great job of like repres, you know, saying this is who I am. And, and, and I think a lot of people this last year, particularly through the pandemic, and I've seen this with our students. And I think we do a little bit of a disservice when we pretend like everything's okay and everything's fine and we don't have any problems and we are totally normal and we're all okay. Everything's fine. And, yeah. You know, I, I did that a lot, like as a working mom through this whole pandemic, I did the whole like, oh yeah, let me turn off my camera and pretend like I'm not juggling a baby on my hip and have two kids at home doing online learning and daycare is closed and and my and I'm totally okay. Um, but I think when we pretend like that, it sends this message to our students that they have to like hide and try and you know and 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 feel overwhelmed, but pretend that they're okay. And, and that that's, I don't think that's a good approach. And so one thing I love is that, um, I think, you know, Chris is great about doing this. I think I do an okay job of, I, I start turning on the camera and I say, you know, and people can see like, Hey, look, I'm juggling multiple things and I'm not trying to be unprofessional, but I also want to acknowledge like, this is hard. And for my students, like, it's okay for, you know, I I recognize that things are hard for you too. So, and we don't have to pretend like we're just all okay Mm -hmm. (laughs) when we're not. So anyway. I think that's a great note to close on. Let's stop pretending we're okay when we're not and be authentic (laughs) with ourselves and each other. Yeah. Good note. Right. When you're in, that's a great note to just be like, it's okay to not be okay as we, as we close our year of pandemic. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, march we're gonna march towards being vulnerable mm-hmm. well thank you both so much for joining me today i have been talking with dr chris 11 and dr jennifer gruey of utah state university take care mm-hmm.